confidence is such a big part of the game, right? If you're, if you feel the confidence of the coaching staff and you feel confident as a player, you're usually going to play better. But if you don't have that confidence and I've been there, I've had coaches that didn't believe in me and you just, yeah, you don't have confidence. You don't even want the puck and you're not going to play your best. That was Mickey DuPont, a former Calgary Flame and thousand game pro who is also the head coach of one of the best U15 teams in Western Canada at Edge Academy. And you are listening to episode 92 of the Up My Hockey podcast with Jason Padola. Welcome to Up My Hockey with Jason Padolan, where we deconstruct the NHL journey, discuss what it takes to make it, and have a few laughs along the way. I'm your host, Jason Padolan, a 31st overall draft pick who played 41 NHL games but thought he was destined for a thousand. Learn from my story and those of my guests. This is a hockey podcast about reaching your potential. Hello there and welcome back to the Up My Hockey Podcast with Jason Padolan. I am your host, Jason Padolan, back here for another episode. And today you're in for a treat with Mickey DuPont. Um, not sure if you recognize the name or not. Potentially if you're from Western Canada, you may. Uh, he, as I said in the intro there, or, or the introduction after his quote, played over a thousand pro games. Uh that's crazy. Played up till I think he was 38 or 39 years old professionally uh, in the top leagues in Europe. He was also uh, an AHLer. He also played in the NHL, and um, and so has obviously seen a lot, done a lot, uh, been around a lot, and uh, tons of knowledge from from all the different places where he's been, different coaches that he's played for, uh, different teammates that he's played with. So. Uh, awesome to be able to have him on. He was also a former Kamloops Blazer, plays, played four years in the Western Hockey League, uh, which where he got his start. So tons for, for him to offer uh, you uh, as a listener here in the next uh, 90 minutes or so, just from his own personal experiences. But what is also super cool about why I wanted Mickey to come on uh, and to share uh, his thoughts and philosophies is because he is the head coach at Edge Academy, which is uh, a very acclaimed academy in the uh, CSSHL out here in Western Canada. Uh, he's the head coach of the U15 prep team and um, and obviously is around these aspiring young players and uh, has to have development at the forefront or else he wouldn't be in the position that he's in. Uh, he wants to protect the development of his athletes uh, and also, uh, you know, and also be able to have a program that is earning respect, which means that is winning and competing. So he has a tough uh you know, balance uh, to find there. Uh, so I, I wanted to interview him for that uh, reason, for, you know, what, what he's doing and his role that he has there uh, with one of these academies. And also he has players that are very, very good players, meaning he is a father of very good hockey players. Uh, we talk about his 06 son during this uh, episode, and I bring up his 09 son, Landon, during this episode. Um, Landon is, is by most accounts the number one available prospect in the 2024 draft if we were to look 18 months down the road uh he's a first year bantam right now which will be in his second year bantam next year if he decides to play there and uh, by many scouts that i've talked to they feel that he would uh he will be the first overall prick pick so so uh mickey has has that uh, that perspective as well. So he's not only a hockey coach, he's not only a hockey player that had over a thousand games experience, but now he's also a hockey dad and he's trying to protect the development of his son and, and navigate, or sons, I, I should say, and, and navigate the right path for them and how they're going to about their business and um, and all the pressures that come uh, with that, uh, especially being a, a high level top prospect. So very, very interesting stuff today. Um, Mickey and I have played against each other over in, uh, well, we played each other in the AHL. Uh, we missed each other at the junior level, but we did play against each other a couple times at the AHL level. And then we did play against each other in uh, in Germany for a year where we actually had a final round matchup for the championship there in uh, in the German uh, top division. And we, we came out on the wrong end of the stick there. So Mickey won, won that war. Uh, so we do have our own personal history, but we've never had a conversation like this before. So this is the first time that I've ever sat down uh, across the screen or across the table from Mickey. So uh, a lot of this stuff was new. 
um, for us. Uh, we had no idea where we were going to cover or how it goes, as is typical of the Up My Hockey uh, podcast scenario. And uh, it was 90 minutes that just flew by, uh, completely flew by. So um, once again, thank you for being here. Uh, thanks for listening. And uh, I do believe you are going to enjoy my conversation with the head coach of the U15 prep team at Edge Academy and Thousand Game uh, professional, Mr. Mickey DuPont. Thanks for having me, Jay. No worries. And I know that we, I just drug you out of the wrapper because you're on the uh, fight in the winter elements coming back from Penticton. Yeah, we were in Penticton for a showcase out there. Um, I coached the Edge U15 prep team. And uh, yeah, we bust back last night and got in at four in the morning. But uh, no, I was up, uh, well, I uh, got a couple hours of sleep and then back to the school here. Well, I was going to say, we were kind of joking uh, over Messenger there that, uh, you know, we, we should be well used to that, especially being uh, old WHL guys. We we learned how to sleep on a bus, so I'm not sure if you can do that at 45 yeah. as well as you could <laughs> when you were 17, but uh, we were we were masters at that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you have a little more room now as a coach. You get uh, four seats to yourself instead of just one. <laughs> right. Yeah, we were laid out on the floor and bring the foamy on board and the whole nine yards. So yeah. uh, what was your closest trip there? I guess it would have been Kelowna for you guys in, in Kamloops back in the day, right? Yeah. Yeah, the travel was quite a bit. I mean, we had Kelowna, which was, I think, two hours. And then the next closest was PG, I think. Prince George was six hours away. Yeah. And then we would do, you know, down to Spokane, Tri-Cities, eight hours. Victoria wasn't in the league at that time. Vancouver wasn't in the league. Um, and then we would only do one trip out east to yeah. Calgary and Prince Albert, all those places. So, yeah, yeah lots I mean, of travel. And, and that was back in the old 72 game uh, schedule, too, right? Like we were on the bus a ton, and there was no one that yeah. had really had great travel uh, in that WHL. Like maybe. Well, I don't even know if those guys would just think that was great travel, but like, you know, Seattle, Portland, well, not, not really. There's just Seattle and Portland out there. And then they had to come to us and like spoke. That was like five hours away for them. So, I mean, we were even in, within our division, we were all over the place, but uh, you kind of didn't even know any different really. At the no. time. That's something that it didn't even really even phase me. Yeah. Yeah. When you're young, you're just having fun and you're with the guys playing hockey. It's a, uh, it's funny. Like at the time I remember, old pro guys i played in Kamloops, and the old pro guys would come back and they'd always say oh these are the best years of your life and we would think what what are you talking about if this is the best years of my life uh, doesn't sound very good <laughs> but looking back yeah those were unbelievable times right you don't have a worry in the world and you're you're having fun playing hockey with the guys yeah, yeah. good times yeah perspective is amazing right as you get a little older and, and uh yeah can look back on things, but <laughs> yeah, man, we were just having fun. Like the bus to me was actually a blast. Like I, I mean, I never got car sick or anything. I could sleep on the bus and, and that was before anyone had a phone or even knew that a phone could come on the bus. And, you know, we were playing cards or telling stories or, you know, having laughs and, and just hanging yeah. out. So uh, that was really where teams were made, I think. And those bonds were formed were all those hours in the bus back in the day. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's a lot different now. The kids now they're on Snapchat and, whatever they do a little different whatever they do i love that <laughs> what do you mean i i, I have we, we have covered that a little bit here and 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 i try my best not to sound like a dinosaur when it comes to that but like i mean you are coach of, of a team of you know young young aspiring hockey players uh you know i work with with the silverbacks of the bchl and, and some other junior guys and even pro pro coaches that i've talked to and and there's that fine line of like allowing kids to grow up and be in the environment that you know that is that is their environment you know what they're growing up in uh, but also like trying to respect the idea and what we know intuitively as like how to grow a team and like how to grow bonds and and like how the phone can kind of get in the way sometimes and sometimes it helps like how do you how do you manage that or do you even worry about it no i mean i don't think we can fight it like the phones are just a part of every everyone's everyday life now uh, so it's not like you can, I don't think it's a good idea to take the phones away during daytime. We do take the phones away at night. Like we have, you know, if we're in the hotel, we say, okay, phones in to the coach's room at, at 10 30. And then we have a big, a big, uh, bag. They just throw them in and then we bring them to breakfast the next morning. Um, but that's more just so they're not 
staying up all night watching videos or yeah. snapchatting whatever they want to do at night so um, just making sure they get rest but but the kids have you know there was no um, pushback on that um, we talked to the, the kids about if we should take their phones away during games like once you enter the dressing room should we check our phones in and they're a mature group and they they agreed like no I don't think we need to do that so we trust them to uh, when they're in the dressing room to kind of stay off their phones and and I think they're pretty good with it. Like we don't uh, we don't see them on their phones much in the in the intermissions. So, right, right, yeah, yeah. Interesting, right? Like, could you imagine back in our day if that would have been something that you know, you'd walk in and you're playing some game on your phone or whatever between intermissions? Oh yeah, yeah. It would have been, yeah. Would have been not. But it's a uh, yeah, and it's I mean it's delicate, right? Because they can get into a lot of trouble. I mean, you've heard stories of phones in the dressing room and you know kids take videos and the wrong videos get out and it's it's big trouble so we we try to educate them that way as well um all the trouble you can get into and all the examples of people that have gotten trouble so right hopefully uh hopefully they're pretty smart about it yeah yeah well it seems like it's totally like i mean <clears throat> I'll use the word culture, although maybe culture is not the right word, but it, it's like a team organization specific thing on how they want to handle it. And I think it, to your point, even asking your players and you're talking about young players, but even at the junior level, pro level, it's usually a discussion amongst that group of how they want to handle that, you know, because, um, you know, there's some there's some examples of teams that uh, that I know firsthand that have kind of changed their policy, whereas like they would come in after practice. And everyone, you know, it's a quiet dressing room, no music's on, and everyone's like doing their phone thing, like you say, like on Snapchat or whatever. And um, and they decided that that wasn't really the environment that they wanted. So then they ended up deciding to, okay, we're gonna leave our phones in the changing area, right? So after practice, when we come off the ice, the first thing we don't automatically do is go to our phones. So then we can, you know, still be engaged with each other and, you know, enjoy practice or, you know, give each other the, the raspberries about something. And, and so that was a decision that, you know, teams can make on their own. And I don't know if there is a right or a wrong, but um, I know like the dressing room was such a special place, right? It was such a special fun time. And, uh, and, you know, to look across the room and to make eyes with somebody and, 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 you know, to have those conversations is good. And if you are, you know, locked in on your phone or the guy next to you is, and you want to talk to him and you can't, you I mean, it kind of does change the dynamic a little bit of what's going on in there. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. I, maybe we should rethink our policy. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I don't think, I don't think it's a lot to ask to, you know, be away from your phone for the three hours of, of game time. Right. And then, after we shower after the game then yeah go wild on the phone do whatever you want but yeah, up until that point like yeah i mean the dressing room that's one of the best parts of hockey hanging out with the guys and and bonding in the dressing room and just talking with your your teammates instead of heads buried in the phone right yeah well i didn't mean to have you say you were doing anything wrong but i mean it is no, but, like a discussion yeah. that i had with one of my guys um, was just like, well, what kind of team do you want? You I mean, this is the junior level, right? Like, what kind of team do you want? You know, and and like, what what do you want to remember from this season or what's really important to you? And like, like the words, you know, family or, you know, t togetherness or, you know, like that kind of, uh, those types of words were coming out. And then and then it was like, well, you know, where does that fit with, with guys, you know, on their phone or interacting on that, if that's like a go-to. And then, so it was like, oh, it was like this collective decision in this certain case where it was like, no, I think we're going to put them away. And, and like I said, it was on board, you know what I mean? But I, I don't think there is a right or a wrong way, but I just know that it was so much fun there. And like that whole dinosaur thing is the best years of your life. Yeah. Well, yeah, it would be, you know, for sure. If you, if you, uh, put some energy into the into the people next to you right so anyways uh, neither here nor there yeah. but um i want to talk about you first of all because we already talked about it a little bit but my goodness man thousand games pro um came came from the western hockey league you uh, camus blazers and that storied tradition there and and you played as a 16 year old yourself so um would love to talk about that and that whole experience for you uh, you were would have been part of the bantam draft i guess at the time that that had just come into existence so um and maybe I'll just let the like the let the audience know that you now have hockey players that uh, I know one of your boys has already gone through it, I believe, and then you have a younger one coming up that uh, is, is a very very high highly touted prospect for the draft in 2024. And um, how did that now reflect on you? So you're 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 the 14 year old or the 13 year old playing hockey. Uh, was the draft a big piece for you at the time? And how did that go for you? Yeah. So back. Uh... 
So back back then in Bantam, I, I I feel like I was always a strong player. Like I, I usually played up in age group, but uh, I was always smaller. Um, so I think that kind of hurt me, obviously, back in back in those days. And I was drafted in the twelfth round of the Bantam draft, and uh, but I ended up sticking with Kamloops as a sixteen year old and playing there for four years. So. So that's a big lesson for for all the kids. I, I love to tell that story to everybody when draft time comes around. Everybody wants to get drafted first round, second round, but if you end up getting drafted in the tenth round, like it, it's not it's not the end of the road. Or if you if you don't get drafted at all, right? Um, and then the flip side, if you do get drafted high, I mean you you've seen it, Jason. Like how many how many high draft picks haven't turned out? Right. For whatever reason, maybe they get complacent or or whatever it is. So so I love telling those stories just from my experience, like the draft is just kind of a blip in time. Um, but there's a lot of work to be done after the draft and there's a lot of a lot of shuffling and kind of, you know, jobs that can be stolen. And it's not the not the end of the road. No. Yeah. I mean, that is, you know, I, we all we all tend to think like you know about six inches in front of our face, and I know that our that our sons and daughters definitely do too, right? And that is the biggest thing for them in their lives. And and I mean, I I I think we get it, we understand it. But to your point, it's definitely like a moment in time. And whether you get drafted, don't get drafted, go high, don't go at all. Uh, the next day is a new day, and you, nothing changes, right? You I mean like yeah, you got to yeah. still have that same approach, you know what I mean, to whatever it is yeah. your development and building your passion for the game and all that good stuff. So, yeah, we want the yeah. feathers in our in our cap, right, and the recognition, but it like here, like it doesn't mean a damn thing. I mean, especially at the Bantam level, you know, yeah. it's not it's yeah. not a contract in hand. It's not you know it's not a higher signing bonus. It's not anything really. You have to be good enough no. at sixteen to play. I mean, whether you're yeah. a first rounder or a twelfth rounder, that's what they're going to look at when you're sixteen, right? Yeah, yeah, and I mean, guys like you that have played pro as well, you've seen it at the pro level. Guys get drafted in the NHL, and they might never make that next step and, and sign a pro contract. So there's, uh, you know, just every year is so big on, on development. Um, every year you have to be getting, be getting better because other guys are. So yeah, you don't want to fall behind. Yeah. And I mean, I've said that on the show before. I mean, roughly 33% of the WHL, give or take the year is, is usually non-drafted players. I mean, and that totally makes sense to me too. Right. I mean, when you're drafting 14 yeah. year olds, right. To your point, you were smaller. Um, well, you, you didn't end up small. I mean, you're five ten. It, it, it seems like, but you I mean probably at fourteen, you were in a towering in, uh, physical force, right? So yeah. uh, it's hard for for a player who's a little bit undersized when they're physically not developed yet to to challenge with some of these kids at fourteen who are already six foot, you know, one hundred and eighty pounds, right? And and I think yeah. that's the, one of the biggest problems with having the bantam draft yeah. be a bantam draft and not a first year midget draft is you're not allowing this an extra twelve months of of growth because some of these yeah. big bodies and I think to you I think that's probably I would say that's the biggest thing at the Bantam age is like you see these big physical specimens mm -hmm. and they're dominating they're doing great but a lot of these other players haven't caught up yet and so when they do catch up like those guys that looked really great now they're not that great anymore you know because they're not just winning on size anymore yeah yeah and it's funny I mean when you talk about projections which a lot of the draft is right like these scouts are projecting what you're going to be well, the WHL scouts are projecting what you're going to be at 16, 17, 18, 19. And now I think they realize a little more than, than back in the day. If you're an undersized guy, is there room for growth there? You know, now skill and speed are a much more important part of the game. So they look at that and then they look at some some guys that have grown already is that the only reason that they're dominating out there is because they're bigger and stronger than everybody like can they actually play the game and think the game um if everybody else catches up to their size are they still going to be good players so it's it's a tough job they have projecting and, and picking the right guys yeah tough totally tough and that's why yeah. it's in a completely uh, inaccurate science <laughs> right it's yeah. you do your best with what you with what you know and um you know the other thing that comes into play too is the is that late birthday players you know i mean it's crazy how few late birthday players get drafted when you look at the, like the whole draft as a whole 
uh, the entirety of the draft. It's it's usually like the January, February, March babies that are the ones that get looked at more. And and to yeah. me, the only thing that really makes sense there is because I mean they've had another an extra ten or nine nine months to a year of growth, right? Like it's. Yeah. When you think at like your boys, and I look at mine, like a year is an immense amount of time, right? Like, and even how they look as players, let alone how much they've grown, right? So yeah. uh, it's tough to really extrapolate that out as a scout. You know what I mean? Like, how do you consider that? How do you gauge where's this kid going to be in 10 months? And I guess that's the big guess, right? You never do know where it's going to be. But um, we, I've been talking about that lately on the show there, and I would just really, I would really wish that the WHO would push to the, bantam i mean to the midget age draft i think that would do yeah. a lot in the families i think it would stop the rush to to get moving so quick you know the extra money that gets spent and all that stuff and allow these kids to develop a little more not feel yeah. the pressure even at such a young age what do you think about that yeah i agree because so like you said my older boy he's in 06 so he was part of that whl draft that was pushed ahead because of covid um so I, I saw with that draft, if they would have had that draft at the normal time in, in May, um, it would have been a completely different draft. So in between May, when the draft was supposed to be, and December, when they actually did the draft, there was a lot of shuffling, right? Because the scouts had an extra, what is it, six, seven, eight months to, to view those kids and kind of see how they've grown in the last eight months and i mean covid kind of threw a wrench into all of that but um you kind of saw some kids developing more some not so much and it kind of a lot of kids you know grew physically during that time so it kind of changed the whole um outlook of the draft i guess for the for the scouts yeah. but i do agree i think uh it is so early i mean even even at that age, like second year bantam, there's some kids that have gone through puberty, some that have, that haven't at all. Um, so it's kind of a tough uh, tough age to do a draft. I think maybe yeah. one year one year later, like they do in Ontario, would be beneficial. Yeah, I mean everywhere else, right? USHL does it then, QMJHL does it then, OHL does it then, right? Yeah. WHL's the yeah. only one. And I, I mean, I think I think it's because of the the competitiveness between them and the well, the AJHL as well, but mostly the BCHL, right? Like they're they're in a war for these players early, and and the earlier they can get their their claws into them, these WHL teams. Yeah. And again, I'm, I mean, we're both WHL alums, right? I think it's a great league and everything else, and they're doing the best to protect their their product. But I think that is like the biggest. That seems like that's the biggest motivating factor to keep it where it was. I mean, that COVID yeah. year you spoke about, like God, that'd have been the perfect time just to like. Have that have that gap instead of doing two drafts in one year. Just allow those 06 kids to be drafted as first year midgets. You know, let them finish their season and then move it to a first year midget draft. But yeah. anyway, they missed. But yeah, like year. like you said, uh, well, the NCAA teams they can reach out December first of your grade ten year, right? So yeah. if they did if they did delay that WHL draft, then I think it would be a lot more competition for the WHL as well because the yeah. NCAA teams would be reaching out and. For sure. But this way they get ahead of it and they, they can hopefully sign their guys before NCAA teams can even reach out. Yeah. There's such a trickle down yeah. effect though. Like, you know, I, I think because like there's so many parents, I mean, I, well, maybe it's a good time to bring up Landon. I mean, Landon, I've heard, and I have never seen him play yet. I've only seen a couple of video clips. So unfortunately I, I really do want to see him play, but I've heard from a lot of people that he's by, by by most accounts, the, the best available 09. If the draft was to happen right now, he'd probably go first overall. Um, so I bring that up. One, that's super cool. And I want to talk about that being a hockey dad for somebody that's that's been recognized like that. But for a lot of these other families that maybe aren't quite as highly uh, you know, rated, they're trying to position themselves as a first-year Bantam to be on the prep team in the second year, right? I mean, you're, you're part of an academy system right now, and same thing happens at the BC hockey level in the AAA, AA, but, you know, there's this emphasis now on the is a bantam age group, and now as young as 12 years old, uh, to where are we going to be for this draft, which now it brings in all this more craziness and more money and, you know, kids leaving home early. And so I just think that tr like, it's definitely a trickle-down scenario from having them be drafted as 14-year-olds. Yeah. Yeah, it's... Uh... Well, there's so many options now. You have the CSSHL, the Zone League in BC. Um, we call it the Alberta Elite League in, in Alberta. Um, and then now this HSL, JPHL, so many options for kids to play in. 
Um, but but yeah, you're right. I mean, most most hockey families they want to position themselves well for the Bantam the Bantam draft, right? So getting on the right team, getting the right exposure, um, which is important. Um, but I think even at this level, it should still be about the development, right? Like you have to be getting better. There's no sense going to the best team, the best Bantam team, and maybe you're behind the rest of the group and you're you're not developing, you're losing confidence. Like so we always try to we talk about a talk about it a lot here at Edge. Like you wanna we try to put the kids in the position the best position for them to succeed. So that's playing with a peer group that's similar skill level, size level, uh, all that, because there's no sense, you know, if you're, uh, yeah, for example, let's say you're 5'2 and you're playing with a bunch of kids that are six foot already, like, I, I just think you're probably going to be losing confidence. You're not going to be getting the puck touches and your development's not going to be where it should be. Um, so sometimes that means maybe playing Bantam AA or, or U15 and then moving up to U15 prep the next year or Bantam AAA. Um, but it's too bad because I'm sure you see it as well. Everybody's in a rush and everybody wants to get there. And, yeah. and there's some, some kids that are ready as, as first years and some need that extra year. Um, and there's many examples of, of kids that kind of, you know, take their time. Um, like there's a great example here of Jake Sanderson. I'm sure everybody knows Jake Sanderson playing in the NHL now. And he, I think it was Bantam. This was way back, but he actually made the Bantam triple A team as a first year. And his dad, Jeff Sanderson played in the NHL a long time. He told the coaches like, ah, like we, we just don't think he's ready. We, we would rather him play your Bantam double A, get the puck touches, develop, you know, touch the puck lots and and be the guy and so they did that and then he moved up to Bantam AAA the next year and and now he's in the NHL fifth round no not fifth round fifth overall uh NHL pick so pretty cool example there yeah I know that's awesome it's actually uh, that's wild you mentioned that because that was a a question in my uh Facebook parent group last week just would you rather play AAA in a limited role or double A and kind of play in all situations, you know, like, what do you think is better? And uh, obviously each, each individual is different from a parent, from a player perspective, but there's uh there's very few that actually like that opt that way that have made a triple A team. Right. And then will opt out of it, you know, cause they think yeah. they're be a little bit too low on the depth chart, but uh, yeah. But and, different, crazy... and different if it's your first year Bantam too. Right. Yeah. Um, cause then you can move up the next year, but as a second year Bantam, yeah, I mean, everybody wants to play that Bantam AAA as the second year, yeah. which is understandable. Yeah. What What about, like, I think that's, like, from these younger ages, from a minor hockey perspective, I, I think it's a different discussion, too. And, and the discussion starts to change once you become a like, major junior or junior A eligible, right? So now 16 years old is the youngest you can play in either one of those leagues. Um some guys step in and play as 16 year olds and play regular minutes. But oftentimes those 16 year olds, no matter how good you are. And Jerome McGinley is a prime example of back when I was playing against him, like he played 40 games or something that year, 44 games, right? He was a healthy scratch for a vast majority of them. Some games he didn't play till the second period was his first shift. Um, and for Jerome, that worked out real well for him. Like he liked that. I mean, he liked being around that environment. He liked being able to practice with those, with those guys, those Memorial cup guys. Um, but I know a lot of kids would have been broken by that and they should have been yeah. playing triple a midget, right. And getting puck touches. So like, what, what, how was that experience for you? Like as a 16 year old, looks like you had pretty good n numbers there when you, when you went there, did you get a lot of ice time and there was no, you know, there was no worrying about getting in and out of the lineup. Yeah. So I think it's, it's all about the situation you're in, right? Like I was really lucky. I came into Kamloops at the right time. They were rebuilding. They had just lost, um, Nolan Baumgartner, Jason Hall, and Darren Keller, Jason Strudwick, Brad Lukowicz. Uh, Brad Lukowicz. So all NHLers, uh, by the way, for those listening. <laughs> yeah. <crazy. laughs> so it was it was perfect for me, and um, and Robin Regeer was the other sixteen year old defenseman on that team, and so we got to come in, and they they kind of let us play and and lived with our mistakes, let us live and. and um, you know, make mistakes and, and learn that way. So we were really lucky we got to play. But same thing, I remember, like, I, I wasn't the top 
1980 born kid in the age group at all. Um, but there were many other really strong 1980 born kids that played as 16 year olds that year, but they were on strong teams and they didn't play much and their maybe development path didn't go quite, quite the way mine did. So yeah, it's all about being in the right situation and, and uh, yeah, just, just that opportunity to play and, and make mistakes and learn that way was huge. So is that is that become part of your overall development philosophy then? Like, would that be what you would suggest for your boys? Like to to make sure you play uh, and not not rush into a league. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, it's huge. Like you mentioned, like even the junior level now, um, like at sixteen years old, are you ready to play? Should you play another year of midget? Um, Seventeen year old, same thing. Like everybody views it as if you're playing midget as a 17 and 18 year old now everybody views it like oh you're going nowhere but uh, i don't i don't agree with that at all like if you're playing midget as an 18 year old um maybe you just need that extra year to develop and, and play lots get puck touches dominate and then you can move into the bchl or ajhl wherever it is um as a as a 19 year old yeah. Yeah. There's nothing. You still have two years left of eligibility for going the college yeah. road. You know what I mean? And that's yeah. very, very rarely do kids leave earlier than that, you know, and those are the special ones. Right. So, I mean, that's really the timeline, but you're, you're right. There's a, there's a stigma around that, right. If you're still playing um, at 17 and you haven't really gotten anywhere, then, you know, maybe you're yeah. not, I mean, it all depends on what, what you're offering the team and I guess where your, where your level of play is at. But um I guess the other thing is too, when you're, when you're that 16 year old and, and you want to play there because now you're thinking, now you're thinking about the NHL draft as your 17 year old year. Right. So like you've, you've had your way around. I think there's an interesting argument for that too, because you've, now you get the league a little bit more, right. You understand like what the demands are. You've been able to practice around those players and everything else. And now as a 17, you're maybe not having those, you know, those rookie tendencies and uncertainties and everything else. Right. So you're, you're, you're a little more ready. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, there's no perfect route. I, I think, I, I think like being a 16 year old that's there as long as you're playing, you know, what I mean, enough. Um, it doesn't have to necessarily be regular minutes. I do think that environment is probably pretty, pretty healthy. You know, um, every organization is different, but yeah, um, yeah. Like even like you mentioned with Jerome, like he didn't play much as a 16 year old, but just being in that environment, learning from those, from those veteran players and practicing against them, I mean, that was for sure beneficial for him yeah. yeah and then you yeah you went on to have like jeepers what 88 point season led the team in points as a defenseman um geez that's like you're channeling your inner roman yossi there and kale mccarr yeah. that's uh, <laughs> that's hard that's hard to do so i mean you you had a great career there and then it also looked like you got drafted in 2000 like how did that happen as a 19 year old did they change the rules there or, or what no i mean that still happens now sometimes 19 year olds like maybe they they get passed over as 17, 18 year olds and just have a, a great season as a 19 year old and, and the team takes a chance on them, signs them and uh, and gets them into the minors right away and or, or they don't sign them right away and they come back to the WHL, the 20 year old. Um, but yeah, I was lucky enough. I got well, I had a great season there that year. Well, I was lucky I had three really good coaches in the WHL. I had Ed Dempsey and then Mark Capshide. And then uh, Dean Evison, who's now coaching in Minnesota with the Wild. And uh, Dean was great for me. He just, he let me play. He let me play with confidence. He let me make mistakes. Um, but he wasn't too structured. I mean, I mean, we did play with structure, but he let me take chances. And he wasn't the guy that was like, you know, our defensemen have to stay on the blue line. He let me. He let me jump up and be offensive and and uh yeah i had a good year and got drafted by calgary and ended up signing with them right away and then played in uh, st john new brunswick was their farm team so I was there for two and a half years i think and then got traded to pittsburgh's farm team and uh yeah then off to europe i ended up playing in europe for 14 years yeah man but you're there yeah you think time. you're and yeah, everybody was knows. And then you came back though too, like, and that was when you had your. Well, I mean, let, let, let's not jump too far ahead. So, I mean, you had 
So you got drafted as a as a nineteen year. I think I think now, honestly, Mickey, I think that you're eligible for two years, and then I think you become like a free agent. So like, I don't think you I don't think they're eligible for the draft anymore. I think that they can you can still get signed, obviously, but I don't think you're draft eligible. I think you have a seventeen year old year, and then I think you, if you get passed over there, then they're still eligible for as an as eighteen year olds. And if they don't get drafted there, then I think it's just a free agent signing. I think now, but uh, don't. Uh, worry. No, there were some nineteen year olds that were drafted last year. I remember there's a guy Ben King. He's uh, he's actually from uh, from Vernon. You're right. Uh, I don't know. He if got he signed. He, I thought he I thought he got signed, not drafted. No, he got drafted in the fourth round to Anaheim. Oh wow! And he uh, yeah he had a great year last year. He uh, I think he scored fifty two goals uh, as a nineteen year old. Yeah. So he got drafted. Yeah. So he's That's back cool. in Red Deer. Back in Red Deer. This so maybe year. they still have the option but to yeah. draft him, but they also, if you haven't been drafted, you can just be signed as a free agent too. Yeah. I think. No, for sure. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So then that drafted. So as as far as an NHL team would be concerned, they they would take. I shouldn't say waste, but they would use a draft pick on that older player. But then that would buy them the time to decide whether they want to sign them or not. Right. Yeah. And then the other way, yeah, you're exactly. just going right out of the, you're giving them a pro contract. So yeah, that makes yeah, sense. And then, yeah, and then they're. They don't have the risk of uh, losing that player to somebody, uh, somebody right. else, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Take a short break from my conversation with Mickey DuPont to remind you about what my hockey is and what my hockey wants to do. And what does that mean? That means that up my hockey is built on the philosophy that mindset matters, that mindset is the greatest gift that your athlete will be able to use. And it's also the greatest gift that the person that is your athlete will be able to use forever. Uh, I believe that a more well-rounded, more diverse, more resilient human will give you a more resilient, diverse, well-rounded, proficient, efficient, uh, enthusiastic hockey player. So that's really what Up My Hockey is all about. Up My Hockey is about growing the person and the hockey player at the same time to give them the skills uh, to be able to manage anything, whether it be uh, being benched on the fourth line or whether that being, means in 15 years they're at an office job that they don't like and they need to work with a coworker. Uh, I do believe that many of the concepts that we discuss here at Up My Hockey and the tools and strategies and tips that I give them uh, are things that they can use forever. Not only will it help them manage and conquer the season that they're in, uh, but it'll also help them strive in the seasons down the road and also in whatever avenues of life uh, life may take them. So that's the philosophy, right? The philosophy is how do we empower young men and women uh, to be their best? And I do believe that those those skills, those life skills, those mindset skills aren't just applicable to hockey. They're ap applicable to academics. They're applicable to any occupation that you want to be. Uh, it is applicable to just being your best. So we use these foundational principles from a voice like mine that's been there, that's done that, that's experienced, that knows where they want to go and, and, uh, and, and has been in the dress rooms they want to be in. And I'm able to speak to them and to talk to them about these concepts, uh, from a platform and uh, a theme that they are passionate about, which is hockey, right? They want to be great hockey players. They want to thrive. They want to impact hockey games. They want to move on in their hockey careers. So because they have this internal intrinsic motivation from this sport that they enthusiastically love, now they're able to listen to some of these ideas and concepts um, with different ears, right? Through, through a different lens. And more often than not, these things stick and these things stick with them and they're able to use them. And this is the greatest opportunity to make a difference on a competitive landscape. Uh, I see differences and changes in a weekend with some of the concepts that we discuss. We, we, I hear calls from coaches and from parents saying it's a completely different player. Well, guess what? It's not a completely different player. It's the exact same set of skills. It's the exact same ability to stick handle and to skate backwards and to skate forwards and to, and to read the play, but they are having a different approach to how they're going to show up or how they're going to, how they're going to uh, thrive and uh, inside the game. Instead of just surviving, they are, they, are, uh, they are getting involved in the game differently. So it's tons of fun right? This, this up my hockey mindset approach. I get to see huge gains and big differences in players and in teams. And part of what up my hockey is, 
um, it provides a program called the Peak Potential Hockey Project. This is my signature program, which is now uh, over 16 months old. There's been over 200 players that have taken the, the course, whether it be through a team or whether it be as an individual. And, um, and yeah, I couldn't be more excited about it. It's, uh, it's four weeks. Each week has a different theme. Um, I have teams taking it this year, and, uh, and they are loving it, and the individuals are loving it. So to get to the point, there is a guided mission of the Peak Potential Hockey Project. That means that you can be an individual athlete anywhere uh, on earth. Uh, if you like hockey and if you want to get better uh, at hockey, whether you're having confidence issues or not, um, this program is for you. This is for high achievers, period. Do you want to maximize your potential if the answer is yes? then this program is for you. If you're actually down in the dumps and struggling with confidence and, and, and struggling to, to find your way right now, then maybe even more so it's for you. But please don't wait for it to be down in the dumps time, to be slumping time, to be on the fourth line, to be the healthy scratch. You do not have to wait for turmoil to take this. I always say prepare for the storm before the storm comes. So if you are kicking butt and if you are rolling this is an opportunity to take this stuff to learn these new skills to push even higher to find new levels of excellence and to also be prepared for when times may not be as good as they are right now so the peak potential hockey project if you're going to do the guided mission i have another uh mission coming up on january 14th so what a great gift for your athlete what a great gift for somebody in your life to take this guided mission the guided mission means that you will get four coaching calls with me at the end of each week there will be a group coaching call in the guided mission for those that are involved in the course and we go over the material and we get uh we get personal and we start making sure that you are applying and executing and being accountable to what is happening inside the program it is my most popular option, uh, and that's why I'm bringing it up. It is a rotating option. Uh, it happens once every two months or so. Once every three months, I offer a guided mission. So the next one is January 14th. So that is open to you, and it's open right now if you want to register. Uh, the other thing is there is spots open for teams after Christmas. Uh, Christmas of 2023, depending when you're listening to this uh, episode. Uh, if you want to take the second half by storm, get your teams involved in something that's super cool, that'll get you guys ready for the playoffs and for the push, uh, then I do have some openings for some teams, uh, whether that be the U15 level or the U18 level. Um, by all means, reach out to me and we can sort something out. So there, thanks for sticking with me. Up My Hockey is about the development of the person and the development of the player, and you can honestly get gains that you can't anywhere else uh, inside that four-week program and something that will stick with these players much longer than power skating or a hockey school will. So reach out to me. Uh, you can reach out to me any through any social media channel, uh, through upmyhockey.com, the website, the contact form is there, social media on Instagram. Uh, you can also reach out to me on YouTube. I have my YouTube channel running where this program is also playing. And uh, yeah, love all the interactions, love the people reaching out, saying thanks and writing the reviews. Keep them coming. Um, but if you want to take part and actually work on your mindset, that's how to do it. Um, upmyhockey.com for the Peak Potential Hockey Project. Now back to my interview with Mickey DuPont. So you go, um, so what, what was that experience like then your first, I don't know, like let's talk about your first your, your first pro camp there. So you sign, you sign with Calgary, you get to go to training camp. Um, as a, as a later, you know, as a, as an older guy, almost pro ready, I guess. I mean, that was really, you signed and then you, you had, you signed and then you went pro the next year, correct? Uh, yep. Yeah. Right. So I got drafted, went to camp, um, and then signed right after camp. Cool. How was camp? Um, Do you remember yeah, it? it was good. Yeah. I remember it a little bit. I mean, it's kind of a blur, but, uh, yeah, I was just young and just having fun didn't really think too much about it. Right. But, uh. I, I always kind of had that attitude, like starting even when I was young, you know, like I said, getting drafted in the Bantam draft in the 12th round, you have to have that attitude like, you know what, I'm going to show everybody else that they made a mistake and I'm, I'm better than that. I'm, I'm going to prove them wrong and I'm going to I'm going to out battle their first round or second round or third round or all that. So I um, always had that attitude. And yeah, I had Jim Playfer as a coach in the minors that year, and, and he was great. He was a D-man when he played, so he was really good at developing the, the defenseman and working with the D. Um, and we actually won the Calder Cup that year, so that was a, that was a great experience too. Really good oh, team. Oh, wow. Yeah. You won the Calder as a first year. Yeah. That's Not the Calder trophy, but the, 
Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the Calder yeah. Cup. The Calder <laughs> Cup. Yeah, no. Calder Cup. Enough. Yeah. Um, Big difference. So when you when you're talking about these coaches that had an impact on you, um, you've mentioned a couple times like that you were able just to play, you know, that you were able to make some mistakes and kind of learn on the go. Uh, do you yeah. feel that that's pretty critical, important for, for, for all players, uh, regardless of age? Yeah. I mean, just thinking about my coaching now, like we were pretty demanding as coaches and we like to keep the, hold the kids accountable. Um, but at the same time, I knew when I played confidence is such a big part of the game. Right. If you're if you feel the confidence of the coaching staff and you feel confident as a player, you're usually going to play better and you're playing looser and, and having more fun. Um, but if you don't have that confidence and I've been there, I've had coaches that I felt didn't believe in me. And you just yeah, you don't have confidence. You don't even want the puck and you're not going to play your best. So um, really try to get that confidence in the players and. A lot of that comes on the players, right? Like they have to earn the confidence in practice um, by just doing things right, like having the good habits and passing on the tape, getting those passes, shooting hard, skating hard, and then the confidence comes, right? So you, you kind of earn the confidence yourself that way. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I find with what I do now, being the mental, mental performance coach for for um, for teams and players, it's it's the ability to handle the mistakes, right? Because a lot of them don't have the toolbox to do it, right? And if you if you're in an environment where maybe it's not as uh, allowing, right, as you're saying, um, yeah. with mistakes, and you're you're with a coach that I mean, you get benched when you make one. Boy, it's hard to change that storyline of what a mistake means for players, right? Like yeah. they can't make one, and now when they do make one, they know there's these huge consequences. Um, it's tough. I mean, it's a tough game because you don't know who's going to be your coach, you don't know where you're going to be, and and these players need to be able to, to handle it and have some way to, to deal with it. Is, is that a, is there some type of a storyline with, with your group there at edge about what mistakes are and what they, what they should mean to the players? Yeah. I mean, we want to, and that's what stuff about this age group, right? It's kind of like that Bantam AAA or Bantam prep, whatever you want to call it. It's kind of the first year of real, real, real competitive hockey where, you know, there's a lot of pressure on the kids. All the kids are thinking about the WHL draft. They all put a ton of pressure on themselves. Um, and the programs want to win as well, right? So you you want the players to play the best they can and learn from their mistakes. So you, there's a lot of teaching that goes on when they do make those mistakes, but you definitely have to be delicate with it because you don't want them to to feel like, oh God, if I make a mistake, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be staple to the bench. Um, and then they're not playing confident. They're not playing loose. They're they're afraid to try plays. So you have to you have to coach delicately that way, I guess you could say. Um, but at the same time, letting them know, like, hey, you know, next time, look for this instead of this. Yeah, uh, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, no, it does. I mean, I think I don't know how, you, how you're like my philosophy with the players is like. I will only really criticize effort is my biggest thing. Like you will, you will definitely find your way to the bench if you can't work hard, you know, like that's, that's kind of a non-negotiable for me when I, when I coach and, and then the other part is it's just in the D zone, right? Like that's where, like where I coach structure, right? Like where, where you kind of need to be and how you need to respond. But when you got the puck, at least I try and let guys be free in the offensive zone and teach more concepts over structure, right? Like a concepts of how to, of how to play the game and, and to let them be creative and let them have fun and let yeah. them enjoy the puck. And, and, and yeah, I mean, if you, if, cause we've all been there, right. Especially back in our dinosaur era, like where you would try like, you know, a toe drag or a saucer pass through the middle and maybe it doesn't work out. And, and all of a sudden that's the stupidest play ever. And you're never going to see the ice again when, when maybe that was the right play, it just didn't work. You know, like I hate to take that away from yeah. you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's funny. You say concepts like uh, there's lots of talk about that, right? You, you want the kids, you know, working hard and having the right habits, um, but you don't want them to be robots. You have to go there. You have to go there. Um, so that's where the concepts come in, right? Like third guy high, like, or two guys hard on the four check, third guys reading. But those first two guys, like we want you going hard. 
hard and and just in the offensive zone, be creative and make plays. Um, you don't want to take away their creativity. Yeah, I know 100%. They, uh, they like, yeah, I mean, to your point, I mean, that's like a concept for me would be like being above the puck, like third guy making sure he's above the puck and above above their high guy in the zone, right? Instead of being like a 2-1-2 two, two or a 1-2-2 two, two or something like that, it's more like where... Are you hearing me at all, Mickey? No, I can hear you, but you're breaking up. Do you want to... Um... I can cut this all out, so don't worry about it. But, uh, oh, there you are. This is a new one here. Remove. Cut to stream. I got you in a new feed now. Yeah, yeah, that sounds way better now. Yeah, my computer was kind of crapping out. Okay. There we go. Okay, perfect. Yeah, awesome. That, that sounds much now? clearer now. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> perfect. Um, but, yeah, back to your point, you don't want them, Yeah. It's funny, like, I find that sometimes too, especially at this level, like you want to win, you do have some set plays, but you want to tell them, you know, this is the set play, but we we have to read as well. Like if you, if this is the play that we're passing to that guy and it's not there, well, then we just play, right? Read, read and react. Yeah. You can't just, you have to do this. And then, yeah. I was joking with, uh my boy, he's on a he's on a double A zone program here, uh, and and I was we were joking with the coach, uh, or I was joking with the coach because they have this they have this face off play that works that works quite well and uh, or has worked quite well. But but it's funny because sometimes like to you, to what you just said, like the end of the play is to hit this guy in the slot, and sometimes there's a guy standing right beside the guy in the slot, right? And and yet yeah. yet a player will grab this puck and like throw it right to the guy in the slot, and that's just when like. You, you know, like that's when the hockey IQ is obviously just showing on these guys that it's just like, I mean, that's not the play anymore. You know, like it's not yeah. there. <laughs> but the kids are so literal, right? Like they, they listen well. And if this is what I have to do, that's what I have to do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's funny. And that's, in, and then that's the individuality of like you doing your job well is probably like understanding those ones that are super literal and just want to be, you know, to please you. Yeah. And then like to allow them like, well, no, we have to hear still think. It's uh, and then yeah. some that don't want to do the play at all, right? They are they, they all want to do their own thing, and it, it's it's fun working with these. Well, regardless of any age, right? Like you got you got the seventeen twenty individuals on there, and they all respond to stuff differently, and they all hear you differently, and you're trying to get the best out of uh, each and every one of them. It's a bit of a puzzle. Yeah, yeah, they're all different, different, uh, different characters. Yeah. Um, where um, so so you talk about your first NHL game because. Uh, you you got called up there your your first year. You had two two games in the NHL. I think we all remember our first game. What was what was that like for you getting getting that phone call that you I mean you've really been waiting your whole life for? You're going to be an NHL, or what did that feel like? Yeah, it was. Uh, I mean, a little different than than most of the stories you hear. I guess our season had ended in St. John. We didn't make the playoffs, and they they had called up maybe five guys to Calgary uh, for the last week or two of their season because they were they were out of the playoffs too um so it was more of a just a carrot for the five guys that got called up you know be around the nhl guys practice and and get into the lineup if you can um but i so i was a d-man up well from age 10 maybe i was a d-man and then my first nhl game they uh they put me on forward so, <laughs> and uh, I'm not going to say no, right? I was just, yeah, yeah, just tell me what you want me to do and I'll, I'll get out there and play. But it's funny, I got into the lineup because Jeff Shantz, who coached at Edge with me last year and the year before, um, I got in the lineup because he was having a baby. So he wasn't playing that night, so I got to play. Uh, so I, I always uh, tell him, thank you. Thank you for that. <laughs> But it was fun. We were we were up in Edmonton. The game was in Edmonton. I think it was the last last second last game of the year, and Edmonton had to win to have their playoff hopes alive still. Um, so even though we were out of the playoffs, it was a, it was a great win for us because we crushed Edmonton's hopes of of making the playoffs. So right. 
So it was a big, uh, exciting win for us. Uh, well, how was that and playing it was forward? Fun. So you hadn't never played forward yeah, in your life, it was, essentially. Yeah, it was fine. I mean, I always joke the smart guys play D. <laughs> but it, it was fun. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I played right wing, and I was just kind of up and down the wing, hoping uh, the other team didn't score and just put the puck deep and, and try to – Try to forecheck hard, and yeah, right. it's kind of a blur looking back at the game. But I remember my my parents drove up. It was in Edmonton, and I I'm from Calgary, so my parents drove up for the game. So that was special to have them there, obviously. And um, yeah, and then the next night played my second game at home in Calgary against Vancouver, and uh, that was that was a lot of fun. I got to play D that game, so that was good. <laughs> good, good. But, well, that's an interesting thing. I mean, it's 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 hilarious that you bring that up now. And and I don't know if you know the Wendell Clark story. Did, did you know that he was he was a defenseman in junior? Uh, no, I didn't so know he, that. He he never played forward, right? So he played defense all through his junior major junior, like even as the world junior guy, like he was a d- defenseman. And then he got drafted oh, wow. first overall as a defenseman. And he showed up in Toronto, and his name was on the dressing room door as a forward. First overall wow. pick, and they tra- they changed him into a left winger. He'd never he'd never played it before. So um, when I interviewed him, I like I never knew that. I was blown away. Like you imagine doing that now to like Connor McDavid or whoever, right? Oh, you're not yeah. your position. Um, let alone like let alone like I mean, th- th- there's first year Adam parents that lose their brains when when like Johnny's not a centerman and he got shifted to left wing, right? Like it's it's nuts how people get so bent out of shape about what position yeah. they're they're playing in, but. Uh, do you think it's a good thing? Like, I'm I'm a pretty big advocate of having kids experiment, especially if they want to, right? And even sometimes if they don't want to, just so they understand the game better. How, how do you feel about that? Yeah. Oh, 100%. I agree. Um, even with my kids, like, I think it's great for them. Uh, my older boy, actually, he's an 06, so he, he's been a forward since about age 10. And they had a couple of D-men get hurt at the U18 level here. And the coach was kind of in a jam. He got, you know, you're down to 4D. Does anybody know how to play D? And he puts his hand up and, yeah, I'll play D. So he's been playing D for the last five weeks. And uh, he's doing well. There's some things he struggles with, like the gap control and the pinches and things like that. But um, good at making the plays and, and joining up, joining on the offense, obviously. And But just seeing the game from a different perspective as well. Um, and then when he goes back to forward, hopefully implementing those things into his forward game. Like, okay, D men are under pressure on the four check. I got to work hard to get open for them because I know what that experience is like. Just little things like that, right? Yeah, no, for sure. Yeah. How to get open? What's uncomfortable in that position? I, I, I've, I, many episodes ago, I told the story about me buying goalie equipment after I was done. I retired relatively young, right? Like 10 years before you at 30. And I still wanted to play a little bit. I was here back at home, but I, I was, I mean, I say this with as much humility as I possible, but I was too good for the beer league here at the time, right? Like to have any fun doing it. Right. But I was like, I was always interested in goalie. So I was like, well, you know what, I'm going to buy some goalie equipment. I'm going to, I know I can go 110% when I'm out there. No one's going to get mad at me. Right. And I have no idea what I'm doing. So I turned into a goalie for like three or four years and it was awesome to like just learn the game from that aspect and what was difficult to do. And like the things that I learned, like that I could have applied then as a forward and as a goal scorer, you know, like shooting through traffic or like when sight lines are, are a problem or what motion is is difficult to do in certain situations. Like I it completely yeah. uh, like it was a whole new world. Right. Like learning that. So, um, you know, defense to forward, same thing. Like you can learn some stuff that's hard for D men to do as a forward. Right. You can. In, in, institute that on your one-on-ones and so yeah i mean i'm a, I'm a big advocate of that and it just yeah. makes you more versatile i mean at the end of the day yeah you know? um, well it, yeah it's funny you mentioned the goalie thing like we we stop practice sometimes and we'll talk to our goalies um you know if we're doing a two-on-one drill or a, we'll stop and talk to the goalies like okay for a goalie what like what's hard for you here? What's harder if, if the shot comes from here or if the D man takes the pass and then it's good for the kids to hear that from the goalie, right? Like the goalie says, yeah, this is hard for me when I have to slide over and, and take this shot or whatever it is. And then the kids kind of think like, Oh, okay. Or at least I hope they think, <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's hard for the goalie. So I'm going to do that. 
<laughs> yeah, no, good for you. That's great. And to yeah. involve the goalies as well. My goodness. Like, that was the other thing I noticed. And, I mean, I love playing – defense now too and like i never go out with the boys and play like i love playing d to your point like everything's in front of you you can see much more so much more of the ice right you can pace yourself you can time things um, but from a goalie they even have another respect uh, perspective a, a step farther back right they see everything right even their demon in yeah. front of them so um when goalies want to be curious and understand the game like they can totally be captains back there right and understanding where people are going to be and and uh and from the goalie perspective now i find that's a really interesting factor because me as a player, I think that I was, I mean, considered my skill level and playing at 31 and everything else, but like my, my, my ability to uh, anticipate where the puck was going to go was probably better than most goalies yeah. have, having played. Right. I, yeah. I, I see yeah. the third guy high. I see the guy going back door. I understand that they're going to probably try and get there. So you can anticipate that movement. And I do watch for that now. Like when I, when I'm, scouting goalies that my middle boy is a goalie so i i really enjoy when he's anticipating that play and he's making he's tracking that puck and he's getting to that open guy that maybe the defenseman doesn't even know is there but he knows is there like that's a massive advantage for those tenders yeah that's cool so your, your middle boy is a goalie hey yeah he's a goalie oh yeah goalie I, yeah that's a lot of stress being a goalie parent it's a way different <laughs> level of, the goal, of parenting, that's for sure. Yeah, <laughs> my wife loses her mind. It's so funny. Like I, I feel that I'm I'm pretty balanced in there. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's obviously it, it. They have a bad day. It's way different than your right wing son having a yeah. bad day. You know. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, but the beautiful part of it is when they have good days. Like that's a really fun position when you're rolling too. You know. Yeah. Oh, totally yeah. impacts the game. Just want to take a short break to give a shout out to everyone who has been giving me a shout out. Uh, totally appreciate all the DMs and uh, and all the comments, text messages, or or otherwise emails of uh, of you of you all appreciating the the podcast and appreciating the episodes and the and the work I do on social media to to put out those clips and to share all the all the good lessons that's going on here. And, and I just wanted to read a couple that came in. I, I should do this more, but I, I, uh, I really want to encourage you guys to participate as you, as the best you can in whatever way that is with, with growing the podcast, um, meaning leaving a review. So I'm going to read a couple of reviews here today. Uh, there's also other ways to, to share the podcast and to grow it. And that's just by talking about it with your, with your friends, with your families, sharing it on your social media channels, an episode, or maybe a, a clip that you enjoyed, um, or what have you. Cause I mean, that's really the, the best referral is somebody saying, Hey, I listened to this and I really enjoy it. And I think you'll enjoy it too. And you'll find value in it. Uh, and if you take the 30 seconds or whatever it takes to write the review and leave a five-star review on, on, uh, on something like, uh, an iTunes platform that, that means a lot, uh, to the podcast as well. So, uh, I had a couple c come in uh, last week, which is awesome. Uh, it's the it's titled "Mental Skill Set Five Stars." Keep up the great work, Pods. Your show is so refreshing to hear another side of the game that doesn't often get spoke about. And that's from Hales Twenty Two via Apple Podcast. I think that's Mike Haley, an old teammate of mine in um, in Spokane, that War Twenty Two. So I I am guessing that's him. If it is, thanks so much for writing that. And if it's not him, uh, thanks to whoever wrote that. I really appreciate the comments. Uh, uh, Review number two, awesome for hockey players, five stars. Simply put, Jason puts out awesome content for any player or parent who wants to learn. His interviews cover so many personalities, experiences, and perspectives. And that's from Chortanoff10 via Apple Podcasts in the United States. I uh, really pre appreciate that, Chortanoff10. I don't recognize that name uh, from the States, so thanks so much for tuning in down there in, in uh, the U.S. Over half of my audience is actually American, which surprised me when I looked it up from, uh, from a downloads perspective. So I uh, really appreciate, appreciate you all listening to, uh, to an old Canadian like me. Uh, I try to make this uh, as geographicless as possible. I know that we do talk about the WHL and we have a WHL, uh, old WHL guest on here quite a bit. And some of my, my discussions are about uh, hockey out here in the West. But I know that these decisions and these concepts of hockey apply wherever you're listening, whether you're in Massachusetts or whether you're in Maine or whether you're uh, down in Texas, right? It, it doesn't really matter because you have decisions to make along the way about what avenue you want to go. And, and, uh, and, I, and I hope you're finding value in these conversations. So thanks again for all these reviews and thanks again for tuning in uh, from wherever you're at. Uh, totally appreciate the support and totally appreciate you, uh, you choosing to spend time with, with me and my guests every week. So uh, keep it up. 
Uh, would love to read a couple more next week. If you if you are one of those people that have listened and haven't left a review yet, take the take the thirty seconds or a minute. This five stars, give it give it a thumbs up. That's all you need to do. Or you can take a couple more minutes and just write a couple lines like like the like the people did here this week. So once again, thanks so much. Now let's get back to the episode with Mickey Dupont. So let's talk about um, the, the the whole Europe experience. I mean, so you you end up uh, well. I mean, we should cover your your goal, and I mean, you've scored more than one. But like, how, how about how about the NHL first goal? Let, let, let's talk. Let's talk about that. How, how did it happen? Who was it against? And and what do you remember about it? Yeah, that was cool. Uh, it was in Vancouver against Dan Cluche, and nothing crazy. Just a low to high wrist shot on net. Um, uh, yeah, but it was a tight game too. I think uh, a three-two win, and Chuck Kobasu, he was also a rookie that year, so we both scored our first goals in the same game. Oh, cool! It was pretty pretty cool for us to do that in the same game. Um, and then when you win, that's even more more reason to celebrate, right? Like it's tough to be happy after a loss, so happy right. that we got the win. Yeah, yeah, no, that's cool. What was the biggest so, so in your in your time in the NHL and you played in the minors and re, re, I mean, you were really productive anywhere that you went. What, what do you think was the biggest difference between the, the AHL and the, uh, and the NHL? Um, yeah, I think the, like the structure in the NHL is much better. Like all the players are where they're supposed to be. Um, there's not as much running around in the AHL in the American league. There's a lot of running around. Everybody's yeah, Most guys are young. And they're just running around trying to hit everybody and um, trying to make a difference. And sometimes don't think the game all that well. But then once you get to the NHL, everybody's playing their position. Everybody's where they should be. Everybody can think the game well. Um, so it's almost an easier game in the NHL sometimes. Um, I only got to play a few games up in the NHL. But, um, yeah, the biggest difference for me was – just the, uh, I don't want to say I wasn't confident up there. Like I, the games I played, I, I was confident. Like I, I could play at that level. Just the size and strength of the guys in the NHL was much, much higher. Um, and then just the, I mean, you'd, you'd, you'd relate to this with what you're doing now, but just the mental, the mental game for me, like I always felt like I was, Whenever I was up in the NHL, I always felt like I was kind of a, a fill-in player until the injured guy came back or, or whatever it was. I never felt like I was truly part of the team. And then because of that, I, I never felt like I really played my best because I wasn't that comfortable and, and confident, mm -hmm. if you know what I mean. Yeah, no, 100%. And I feel, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I can totally relate to that too, because that was essentially where I felt I was, you know, when I was with Florida, I didn't actually feel that because I was like one of their drafted players got brought up, you know, it seemed like I was, you know, part of the funnel of being there and maybe being like a long time Florida Panther. So when I did get my, I think I had 19 games there in my rookie season before I got traded at the deadline, uh, I felt that part of it, like I had a role, like it was a fourth line role or a third line role. It wasn't like I was playing power play minutes, but I mean, it was just sort of like that was part of the plan, right? Like just getting comfortable first year yeah. and figuring it out and, and being one of the guys. And, um, and then I got traded and then it kind of never felt like I was a part of it from that point on. And, and, uh, and then looking back on those first 19 games, although I felt a part of it, like I didn't really like step into what that was. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah. and that, it's a complete mindset. Like, to your point, it's it is a mindset thing. Like, it's not a skill thing. It's like, how, what is your approach to that opportunity, right? And what are you yeah. what are you doing about it? Regardless of whether you're called up as a as a midnight scratch because somebody rolled their ankle, or or whether you've earned that spot out of training camp, like what you yeah. do with that is up to you, right? And I know that I made a few mis missteps with that. And that is that is one thing that I definitely try to align players with is like make the most of whatever that opportunity is whenever you get it. Yeah, you have to have that attitude like, screw it, I'm just going to go play and, and show what I can do. But it's hard at times because you know when you're a call-up, you know, a couple of mistakes and that could be the end of your uh, your shot. Yeah. Yeah, they just say you're not ready. That's the thing. But the other the other yeah. side of it is like, 
and and so what if you don't try and then you get sent down because you were just you didn't make a difference you yeah. know yeah. you know what i mean no, like it's right. like you, yeah. it's like it's like a death by a thousand paper cuts or maybe it's a, maybe you go out with a bang right or maybe you don't go out at all but like which way would you rather go out right like living big living large living courageously or playing yeah. timid and playing small and not showing your best you know like yeah. it's kind of a decision right yeah make mistakes while you're uh you're going hard yeah don't be timid yeah well, you'd rather, I mean, I think, I mean, hopefully no, you don't make the mistakes, but I think that would be, that would be the terms that I would prefer to go out with, right? Um, you know, that I tried, that I gave it my best, that I played yeah. big and bold, right? I and mean, that was, yeah. that's easier to be in the minors saying, telling yourself that than, uh, oh, like I chipped it in every time I got it. I didn't want the puck. You know, I didn't want to make a mistake. I made sure I was a third guy high. I played super safe. Ho-hum, yeah. right? That's yeah. pretty yeah. vanilla. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and that's the same thing. I mean, I think that's at any age too, right? I mean, these guys that are that are you know nine, ten, eleven forwards on a in a U fifteen team are kind of going through the same thing, right? Like the play's pretty fast for them. Like they they don't get out there maybe all that all that often, and they're nervous. And you know, that's the thing that I try and talk with with my guys about whether I'm coaching or whether I'm doing the off ice coaching with them is just you know try and be courageous, right? Be brave, yeah. be bold. Yeah, it's way more fun playing that way too. Yeah. Yeah, and it's delicate at, at this level, the U15 level. Like some kids, you might tell that to, and and they'll they'll take that as okay. I got to take the puck and I got to go end to end. But that's not that's not what we want, right? No. Yeah, <laughs> and it doesn't work. Yeah, I mean, that's not what you want either. Yeah, so that's no. that is the thing that I found too. Like, thanks for bringing that up because communication, like, is so imperative. Uh, like and 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 like the granular level of it too right like what does what does that look like to you as a player i mean you might be a number five defenseman like playing bold and courageous as a number five d man you got to know who you are first of all and then what does that yeah. mean to you right like for you and your game does that mean maybe stepping up and having that big hit a foot inside the blue line maybe that means ending to play a little earlier in the d zone you know like but that kid might think oh this means i have to go end to end well no i never wanted you to go end to end that's nobody wants you to go end to end right yeah um, so anyways, like it, it is, it, it is an interesting recipe because everyone's recipe is a little bit different for what that means. But, um, yeah. uh, that's the part that I enjoy. I, I get a lot of, I get a lot of joy out of that when, when you can make it really be simple for them, like very clear, like one or two things that like, this is what that means. And then they can go out and try and execute instead of having to be yeah. big and bold. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It comes down to communication, right? Like really simplifying what, what their role is and what, what you want from them. Yeah. Did you have any so, great communicators uh, in your coaching? Uh, I mean, in your playing history, as far as from the coaches uh, aspect? Yeah. Yeah. Looking back, I had a lot of good coaches. I had, uh, like I mentioned, I had Ed Dempsey, Mark Habscheid, Dean Evison. Um, Habscheid was a real hard coach. Like he was really hard on the guys, um, but he made us better. Like he, he pushed us, uh, but we all we all developed we all got better because he pushed us so hard um yeah dean evison was a great coach i think that was his first or second year coaching actually um because he's still doing it now in the nhl level at the nhl level um and then in the minors yeah jim playfair was great obviously he's had an nhl career coaching um uve Krupp, remember that name yeah sure Did i do you, yeah yeah uve Krupp. Uh, so he coached me in Berlin and he was, he was great, great communicator, um, great storyteller. Like he could just talk for days. Uh, so he was, he was, uh, he was a treat to have. Well, you mentioned he iceberg. Had... Now we got to go bring it up. So, uh, you know, Mickey, for those of you listening, played, as we talked about years and years o overseas, over a thousand games pro in total. Uh, and he had a stop in, uh, well, more than one, two stops in, in Berlin, but uh, in his first stop in Berlin, he, he uh he won a championship there on uh on uh to my to, to, to on on my benefit because when we were playing for Mannheim at the time and we got to the final with the Adler and we lost to the Ice Bears so Mickey won a championship over there and and I got the bridesmaid medal so uh we, 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 we I'd be I'd be remiss if I didn't bring that up for you there Mickey yeah <laughs> no that was a lot of fun yeah Berlin was Berlin was great great organization they're they have the same owners as the LA Kings. Mm -hmm. um so they they run it really professional and try to give the players exactly what they need and um great group of people there 
uh, great group of guys. We won a couple championships. So it was, I mean, that's winning's fun, right? Yeah. Big budget um, there too. You guys were, a lot of guys were making a lot of money there. I know. And when we were playing, man, well, man, I'm at a big budget too. Like there's a few teams in that league that would, that would run a much higher budget than other, than other teams. Yeah. Nice there was one. And uh, it was fun because there was a couple of times in there. I don't know how often that happened, but uh, you guys played in that big rink, you know, I think it almost held 18, 19,000. And, and it, it was, it was full uh, more oh, than yeah. once that I remember. It was a pretty awesome environment there to play in too. Yeah. 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 And it's a great city. I mean, away from the rink, it was unreal. Like when you have people come over to visit, there's so many things to show them and so many things to do, whether it's museums or restaurants, bars, like just the culture there is amazing. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Did you enjoy your time in um, Switzerland or Germany better? Uh, you know what? Lots of people ask that and it's it's hard to answer because they were, they were both great, just very different. Like Berlin is not a very, I wouldn't call it a beautiful city um but culturally it's amazing right one of the best in the world um switzerland we were just outside zurich uh so close to luzerne which if anybody any listeners have been over there the beautiful beautiful cities um so everything's clean everything's safe great for young families which we had at the time um the hockey's really good the hockey the hockey in switzerland is the main sport it's it's um, more popular than the, the soccer over there. So they're pretty, they put a lot of pressure on the, on the players and you open up the newspaper and they have, you know, the stars of the game and the, the, they used to call them the plums of the game. So those were the, you didn't want to be the plum of the game. <laughs> so that would, uh, yeah, if you were the plum in the newspaper, it was not good. And, oh my God. So they do a three yeah. stars and they'd also do like the worst player award. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my. And that's then a little blurb about why. Yeah. That's hilarious. <laughs> well, I talked to Matt Donnelly like, there. Lots, I, lots uh, he's a GM there. of, um, geez, what's he's a GM of now? I can't remember the team that he's a GM of, but, uh, yeah, you know, Lugano. an old Kamloops blazer. Lugano, yeah, Lugano, Lugano right. Yeah. I, was, I was on a call with him the other day, and he said that this year, um, I mean, that league's usually really good, but he said with the war this year, uh, that a lot of the European players, meaning like the Swiss and uh, and the Finns and what have you, weren't going back to the KHL. So, um, oh, yeah. So they have, a like, the, the league's real strong. And I guess when, when you, well, I don't know, you played there. 16 did they have six imports then at the time because now they have six imports too yeah they only had four back when i played okay so like when yes. yeah when i first got there they only had three in, in that area and then they went to four and now they're at six so he said that league is like super strong like it's a really yeah. strong league right now one of the best in europe and they take their hockey pretty serious so did you so then you had your boys like your boys were out growing up in that swiss hockey system or was that back in germany now where they were growing up playing hockey well, both like they started in Switzerland and uh, that was great. Like the youth program there is unbelievable. Um, they would skate and they, they do dry land at a young age too. So even from, you know, whatever you want to call it, Timbits or um, over there, they call it Piccolo. But when you, when you first begin playing hockey, it's a lot of skating at the beginning. And then it's, you know, lots of small area games and things like that. And they would do dry land right after, even at the age of five, six, seven years old, which I thought was great because, you know, everybody talks about multi-sport athletes, but with the demands of each sport now, it's it's so hard to find time to be a multi-sport athlete, right? So having that dry land component built in for the young, the young kids was fantastic. Like sometimes they would just go play soccer. Sometimes they would, you know, do a bunch of plyometrics and things like that. Um, so I thought that was really beneficial too. Right. Yeah, cool. So it's not yeah. necessarily um, them learning a sport necessarily, but because they're outside not skating and not doing the typical hockey movements, I mean, you're, you're kind of accomplishing the same, the same thing is what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. So they played, uh, they played in Switzerland and then we moved to Germany and they played in Germany. Can you, can you talk about that that the development model there? Because uh, I know that like there's countries out there that are doing it quite a bit differently than how we're doing it doing it here, and and make the Finns, for instance, too. I was talking with Yerke Lume um, on one of the alumni trips for the for the for the Maple Leafs, and he was saying that like the way they do it there, and I'm not sure if this is Switzerland or Germany as well, but like 
they don't even play games until like 10 years old or something like official, like regular games like that. It's, it's all development based. It's all like practices. It's all small area game type stuff. And, um, and then they don't separate kids either until about that age, right? Like they don't like everyone's yeah. together doing the same thing and which is completely opposite of what we're doing over here. And I don't know which one's better or which one's worse, but what was your experience with the youth programs there when it came to that kind of stuff? Yeah. So they, they were on the ice a lot, uh, which was great for the development, right? Uh, they would play games, but the games would be cross ice games. And like you said, everybody was together. So let's say it was U9. So all the seven, eight year olds would be together. And then if there was a tournament, they would just make, make a team, make a roster, however they wanted to do it. They would, they would pick different guys for each tournament. So everybody got to play. So they didn't separate into team one, team two, team three, like we do over here. Mm -hmm. uh, it was more mixed, which some people disagree with, but um, at the young age, you know, whatever, uh, they're playing cross ice hockey and um, you have some stronger players, some, some players that need work, but everybody's mixing and it's good for everybody. Um, and then, yeah, as you get older, the stream, you know, tightens, obviously. Um, so my older boy, his last year in Berlin, he was in, uh, I guess, an academy. So it was Ice Baron Junior Berlin Academy. And uh, so I think that was their U, U13 team. And uh, it's all, and it's so, so cheap too. I mean, you pay a thousand dollars and everything's included. So uh, that, that just keeps everybody, everybody has access to hockey, right? The, that's kind of, the bad part about hockey now is it's so expensive. I mean, the equipment, the the registration, everything, it just, it's not accessible to a lot of people. So it's too bad. Yeah. Um, so they're able, there, how were they able to subsidize so you there? Do you know what their, what their, what their formula was? Yeah. It's, I think it's just a lot of government money. Like gov the government puts a lot of money into the youth sports and, and it's run that way. Right. As far as I know. Yeah. Yeah, that's. Interesting. I didn't ask questions. <laughs> yeah, no, I hear you. But it's it's kind of uh, like it now, like now that I'm involved in what I'm involved in, and I'm, and I'm seeing, you know, like the, like where can we grow this game, and how do we grow it, and how do we how do we not make it so entitled, right? Uh, if that's a goal, you know, I mean, I don't know. It's not a goal for everybody. Some people don't care, you know, and, and I'm not saying they should or they shouldn't, but. It, I'm curious about finding ways to level the playing field for sure, you know, like. Um, and not even mean level the playing field, like everyone has to strive to be an NHLer, but like just to play good, strong development hockey and not have to, you know, fork out 15000 to $20,000 a year to do it, right? Like I, I think yeah. that should be something that we should be trying to figure out because it happens really young, right? Like where, you have, where, you're, where you're putting in a lot of money to, to, play, to play development hockey. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure what the answer is. I mean, it's, it's such a business now with, the spring hockey and the, the academies and the uh, camps and everything. I mean, take one last short break here from the discussion with Mickey DuPont to let you know about 2023 and the fall of 2023, where I will be offering two associations uh, and academies and, and prep schools uh, the ability to license the up my hockey uh, suite of products. So if you are in a position, an administrator, or if you are a president or director of hockey somewhere, and if you would like to have mental fitness be a plug and play type of situation for your program, then up my hockey might be a solution for you. Uh, that is definitely uh, uh, a route that I'm taking up my hockey. Uh, instead of being a one and done and buy a program and you're finished, you can actually maintain um, licensing options for all your players and all your competitive teams um, over a year, two year, three year period. Uh, you'll get the up updated programs, you will get uh, coach training, you'll get leadership development, you'll also get uh, the mindset development side. I know this is becoming a very big piece of many developmental program uh, programming uh, scenarios and it's also a piece that is hard to fill. 
uh, whether it be locally or otherwise. So to have an online component with, uh, with people that can come in and serve as a coaching aspect as well has been something that has uh, been come to my attention from, from people inquiring about whether I can do this and will I do this. And that is something that will be happening in the fall of 2023. So if you are one of those programs, uh, like I said, that would like to have uh, mental fitness and personal development be part of your competitive program, uh, by all means, reach out to me and we can talk about what that can look like for you um, next season. It's good to look ahead. It's good to look forward. And uh, it's something that you guys can market and help with your recruiting as well to, uh, to be able to serve the mental health and mental fitness of your players. Uh, the mindset development, we all know how important that is. And uh, and to have something that is is a done for you tailor made uh, scenario takes a lot of uh, pressure off those who have to make the decisions, and also allows great content to be delivered to your uh, to your uh, members. So yes, uh, next year by all means reach out. You can reach out to me at Jason at upmyhockey.com is my email, or on my website upmyhockey.com. Now back to the interview with Mickey Dupont. You talked about your your older boy, and, and and maybe I just want to talk with you about being the hockey dad, and and, and uh, you know, and, and the situation Landon's in there. I know you're coaching him this year uh, as an 09, and I and I, I mean, last time I checked, I think he's in the top 20 in in points in in the in the U in the prep league there, and and maybe the only defenseman on the board. Uh, so obviously doing really well. How do you like? How do you handle him uh, just as as your son, and as this and as this hockey playing prospect that probably has designs of wearing an NHL jersey one day. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's hard at times. I, I try to teach him, or I mean, treat him like everybody else on the team. Um, but, you know, to be honest, he's my son. So, you know, we drive home in the car after the games. And so you get to spend more time with them. Um, but I think the biggest thing for me is, you know, being through hockey for however long I played, um, just knowing that it's such a long road and seeing examples of kids that get burnt out and um, lose that passion for the game. The biggest thing for me is just making sure my kids love the game and, and want to show up to the rink, right? Like if they love hockey, they're going to want to come to the rink. They're going to want to put in the work and, and go on the ice and, and get better that way. Um, so I try not to put too much pressure on them. Obviously you, you know, you talk to him about certain things like, ah, I think, I think you need to work on this and you're doing this well. Um, but just very cognitive of not putting too much pressure on them. And, um, cause I know that, you know, you, I'm sure you have examples of people, you know, that just felt too much pressure and just kind of fell out of love with the game and, and stopped playing at a young age. I, I love that, but uh, if if you could maybe expand on that, because I love the second level of the questions. Like, so what what would that mean for you guys who are in that car ride? Like, what what is you not putting pressure or extra pressure on him? Like, how how do you go about that? Uh, well, like I don't know. I mean, there's examples of there's some parents you see the kids get in the car and the kid the kid is frowning the whole time home, and the the, the parents are just yelling at him. Like, I don't think that's healthy for anybody. Um, but obviously, like I said, like keep the kids accountable. Like if the kids are, if my boys are not working hard or, or whatever it is, like you have to be honest with them and let them know, like, you know, you can't continue this. You gotta, you gotta turn this around. Um, but just having fun with it. Right. Like that's the most important thing. Like if they, if it's not fun for them, they're not going to want to come back to, to practice and play and right yeah how do you protect the passion like i that is something that i do i mean i i think you know from, from the mindset side like I, I i'm definitely a proponent and a believer that where you where you focus your attention like those things are going to grow right they're they're going to they're going to expand and that's and that's going to be something that becomes a habit for you so i I definitely tell my high performers, my high achievers, who are generally very critical of their games, right? Sometimes overly, that we have to be able to celebrate the good stuff. We have to take time to acknowledge what's happening well, right? Um, yeah. But I also encourage them to focus on what they love about the game, right? Like what they love about going to practice, what they love about playing the game, you know, when when they're in the competition. Um, so, you know, that, that that does grow roots, right? And they're focusing on those things and, and then hopefully that's helping them grow the passion for the game. How, uh, 
so which is also fun to your word, right? Like those things are fun. The things that they like make it fun. And then sometimes they can focus on trying to accomplish those things more. How, how do you, how do you, uh, judge the thermometer, uh, you know, the temperature there of, of your, of your team, or maybe even your son when it comes to that passion meter, because throughout the course of a season, it does go up and down. How do you protect it? Yeah, no, I mean, when we talk about, uh, projecting what the kids are going to be moving forward, that passion piece is huge, right? Like if you see kids that really play with that fire on the ice, I think those are the kids that are going to continue to get better and better and then reach the higher levels. And can you teach that? Can you teach that passion or, or change it? I'm not sure how much you can, but, but like you said, um, the more that you can, uh, expose them to hockey. Like, I think that that was a big thing with my kids, like just being around being old enough that they could come to my games when I was playing and, and be around it and, and see me play, see dad play. I think that that goes a long way that, that kind of adds some passion for them. Um, I hope it didn't add any pressure. I mean, uh, I don't think it did. Like I wasn't like a, a Wayne Gretzky type guy, you know, like a, if you're Wayne Gretzky's son, that might be a lot of pressure, but um, I don't, I don't think they feel pressure. And that's another thing you, you never want the kids to feel pressure. Like they have to succeed. Um, and I don't think they do. I always have to be cognitive, cognitive of that with my younger boy too. Like he's, like you said, he's getting a bunch of attention already. And I, we talk about it and then just kind of tell them like, yeah, like don't, don't pay much attention to that. Just keep playing, having fun, getting better. Don't worry about all the, the junk on social media. Yeah, I know. And there's so much of it now for them. Well, being the coach of a, of a prep program, that's, I mean, a really respected prep program in, in edge. Um, I'm, I'm friends with Jerome McGinnell as well. You know, a, a counterpart coach of yours there at, uh, at rink here in, in the Okanagan and, uh, we're talking about passion, right? And so one of the things uh, of why these academies work and why they draw some of the parents' attention and the scouts is, you know, that it's a hockey, definitely a hockey-centric program, right? You're on the ice a lot. You have ice almost every day. It's almost like a junior environment. Um, I'm sure you see it amongst your own guys, too. Like, some maybe thrive through that thing, and, and some maybe it gets to be quite a bit for them, you know? And I don't think it's – sometimes it's not that they don't love the game, but it's just a lot. You know I mean? Do you have a hard time um, or trying to find that, that balance for, for the entire group, or, or what do you do when you feel like maybe they're uh, – you know, they can maybe use a break, but yet you have that practice time ready to go. Um, how, do you, how do you go about navigating that? Yeah, I think that's where you add in some games, right? Like you might do some more small area games or a – uh scrimmage type scenario or you know 20 minute shootout at the end of practice like we're, yeah. we're kind of going through those days right now where the beginning of the season was super exciting um september october november and now it's kind of kind of a little bit a bit of a lull in the schedule we had a really big tournament here in calgary two weekends ago um and then after that it was kind of like oh, okay the kids were tired Kind of feeling that lull so let's play a few small area games in in practice and then uh kind of ramp it back up for december have a break right after christmas and then come back in january but um but it's a good point you make like sometimes in the schedule i mean you can't you can't go pedal to the metal all season right you, you yeah. have to you're gonna have valleys and you know, highs and lows and you got to find some time to relax and maybe have a little more fun instead of just teaching, teaching, teaching all the practices, maybe throw in some, some fun practices. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Or maybe take a page out of the Swiss model there and just have them go, uh, have them go to the gym and play some basketball or something for, uh, yeah. You know, yeah. For, for a turn yeah. or whatever. I mean, I've, yeah, I, I, is great. What's that? Like we, it's great. I don't know if you've ever been to edge here, but we have, the two hockey rinks and we have we're connected to the school so we have gymnasiums and a soccer field out back so so it's great we we do have that luxury to you know if, if we don't want to go on the ice we can go back in the field and play soccer or basketball oh, that's fantastic. Whatever it is. yeah 
That's really my like. That's one of my my big aspirations. Without my hockey, is like to eventually get into the space of ownership, whether it be an academy or whether it be a you know a junior team. At the end of the day, um, that because I think that's part of the missing piece, actually, which is completely a different tangent. But like these programs run right, and they do a great job developing. But then there's really like then they just hand them off to whoever there is to go right. Like there's no placement right of in the junior A. There's no placement in major junior. And yeah. I think that'd be a no, really yeah. interesting piece, right? If you could actually have a team that edge would own a team say in calgary uh, that not obviously all your players could go to but those that were accomplished and developed enough and like they, they would have a place to, to play if they wanted i think that's kind of cool but yeah um my like academy would team, have something to do with that though like something to do with uh like maybe not like a, a whole time sport but there would definitely be more engagement with other things right just to keep the mind fresh keep the body fresh you know hopefully keep the yeah. spirit up and the mental health and i think that'd be a really fun thing to experiment with that's my that's my big dream i just i've never said that low, uh publicly so thanks mickey for making yeah. me announce that <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh, i think it's a good idea i mean a little bit off topic but um when we were talking about like the spring hockey and the specialization in sport I think like lots of kids play spring hockey now and I would I think it's a great idea to have like a, a spring hockey slash soccer program or or slash whatever program so they're they're doing their spring hockey but then that whole hockey team can go play soccer twice a week as well yeah cuz cuz I find like even soccer like our kids played soccer growing up as well as, as spring hockey. And it was great for them, but then it got to a point where both of them became so demanding. They were like, well, you can't play soccer. If you're going to play hockey, you can't play hockey. If you're going to play soccer, we need you to commit to hundred percent of the practices and games. Um, so if you could have some kind of a program that kind of blended both, I think that would be a really good idea. That's an awesome idea. I mean, I've, I just wonder if the parents would go for it. Like I, I was actually before our call, I was, I, I'm running three, three different spring things this, uh, this year. So like a 2010 team, a 2011 team, and then a 2009, probably 2008 slash just, you know, more development, oh, yeah. not, not really yeah. a spring program. But the, one of the things, I mean, to your point, like my philosophy without my hockey is that you should like a better, a better well-rounded person and a better well-rounded athletes make better hockey players. You know, like that's kind yeah. of the foundation of yeah. where I, where I yeah. start everything from. And because of that, like my spring program, I want players to be able to play uh, lacrosse or baseball or soccer. Like during my program, like, I'm definitely not, I don't design it. So they have to be there all the time. I don't tell them they have to be there all the time, but I do set my practices up in a way that I think allows it to happen, right? So there's no weekend practices. I try and keep the games to a minimum on the weekend so they can go play their their uh, their soccer or baseball games or whatever the case may be. And um, if practices overlap, they're allowed to pick what they want. Uh, so I try to, you know, consciously figure out how to, how to allow that to happen. But to your point, it might be even better just to like, don't worry about Vernon minor soccer or whatever, right? Like, let's just, we'll, we'll do a soccer program with the hockey. You don't, you, you, there's no conflicts in. We're not going to be, you know, obviously going to soccer tournaments, yeah. but we're going to be playing and we're going to be having fun and we're going to be with each yeah. other. And, you know, yeah, they're all competitive kids and yeah, having fun. Yeah. It'd be, that would be interesting. The only problem is, is like, you know how it is with anything, I guess, is there's, uh, everyone has a different idea of what's right. And like the odd kid might not like yeah. soccer because of that, they're not going to go to your program. And, yeah. you know, so I think uh, it, it comes in be different, different ideas there. But I did talk to, you know, you know who I talked to the other day um, is the director. I think it's Seanigan Lake. Is that, that's the prep program out on uh, Vancouver Island. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Right. So, yeah. So his uh, Miss Compton is his, is his last name. And I can't remember his first name. Yeah, Jeff. Kid. Yeah, Jeff. Jeff. Yeah, yeah, Jeff. Yeah. Yeah. Dylan's a son, plays for the Vipers. Heck of a heck of a hockey player, a good defenseman there. But we had a call the other day, and uh, he was talking about being the the hockey director there, and and uh, he loves the program at Shawnigan Lake. But like, but when the season ends, hockey ends, right? Like, which isn't the case at, at uh, probably at Edge and at Rink. I know they keep running all the way through to the end, right? But at Shawnigan Lake, they have yeah. to pick another sport at that point. Like oh, they have wow. to go somewhere else. And, and yeah. he said that he likes that, but he's like, there's a lot of parents that don't though. Right. Cause they want to be doing the hockey, the hockey, the hockey, cause they think it's a full time yeah. thing. So like they battle that at that level, but I do think it's an, it's an interesting concept that they, that they try and run there, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for edge, that's a, it's an advantage when we talk to families, when we recruit, uh, like a lot of people like that, we go in, we still practice three times a week and we're in the gym three times a week during spring. And that's all built into the, to the program, which a lot of people like. Um, 
but I do agree with, you know, like yeah, after the season, the kids, yeah, skate a couple times a week, which is great, but I would love for them to get out and play, play soccer. But I mean, you, you know how it is to the older you get, it's more specialized and yeah. it's more skating and, uh, and gym time rather than just going playing soccer and football. So here's what we'll end with this, maybe just cause I'm, I'm, I'm curious and maybe it's a good one. Um, because your boys are now, I mean, two years apart, I think, in 06 and, no, three years apart, in 06 and in 09. Uh, the 06 is obviously a little further along, um, still wants to be a hockey player. Landon's coming along, uh, top prospect that a lot of guys are trying to chase. Do you make them put the skates away uh, at any point in the summer, or do they skate all the time, or what is your personal philosophy there for how to handle the summer months? Yeah, we usually put them away for July. So we, uh, and I'm not saying this is right or wrong. It's just kind of what, what we do and what, um, so we, again, like we would skate three times a week during, what is it? April, May, June. And then uh, July, we, we take off, we go to Okanagan or go wherever, you know, relax. And then August, usually three times a week on the ice. Um, but I think the off ice training is, is really important. Once you get to that 14, 15, 16 level, as, as most people know. Um, so they're in the gym, you know, in August, skating in August and then wrapping up for the season. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. yeah I mean, and that's, that's essentially what we do. Like right now, my kids are younger though. Like my oldest is an 09. My youngest is a 12. And last year I made them take, essentially when spring hockey ended in the first weekend in June there, I made them put their stuff away till August. So they had, they had two months where they, where they, yeah. I wasn't letting them skate. Uh, and yeah. I was not popular by the way. Yeah. With, 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 with saying <laughs> yeah. that. Um, but I do think it's good. I mean, whatever, give the body a break and go experience the different things and, and, and get into the gym. Like that's the other thing I think is, is good about it is that you, you encourage them if they are wanting to be hockey players and hockey is important to them. Well, now they're not on the ice. So what, what are they going to do about that? Right. Are they going to go shoot pucks in the garage? Are they going to stick handle? Are they going to go to the gym or, or find a workout? You know? So I, I like them getting, yeah. making them get involved in it um, with not being on the ice. So anyways, that's kind of where, where my mindset is too. But uh, again, that's tough for me to have the philosophical alignment because that also means that I'm not doing programs in July, which maybe people would want to pay for. Um, yeah. but I'm not going to offer them because I don't think anyone should be skating in July. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, I mean, they're on the ice a ton during, uh, well, August until June. So they need yeah. a, they need a break sometime. Yeah. How about maybe we'll end, uh, are you, pl- uh, just allow you the space to talk about edge because I know, uh, you know, you're, you're a head coach there. And like you said, there, there's a recruitment aspect involved and there's a lot of choices out there for players now. Uh, wh- what brought you to edge and, and why, uh, why do you think it's a good place for, for players to, to go? Yeah. I mean, there, there's a lot of good programs out there. Like we said, everybody has lots of choices. Um, we really like edge cause I like how everything's under one roof. Um, you have the schooling right here. You have the, uh, off ice training right here, the rinks, uh, everything under one roof. So it's nice and convenient that way. Um, you're not shuttling around town. Um, so it works well for our kids and I feel like it's, I feel like it's become the, the top league to play in at the, the U15, U18 levels. Um, and then, you know, the development is, is a big side of it too, right? You're, you're on the ice more, you're with like-minded kids pushing each other in the classroom and on the ice. Um, usually have really good coaching, um, so it's a, it's a good fit for our family uh, and uh, with the model. So we're all, you know, practices are done during the day. So weeknights are, are free. So it's uh, from a family standpoint, it's been great. Like we, we go home and we can have dinner at the table, uh, the whole family. So it's, it's kind of nice that way too. I love that aspect. Actually, I had a, that conversation the other day, the kind of the pros and cons of the academy versus like what we're doing double A right now, right, which I think has been an awesome solution for us and our family and for Hudson where he's at in his in his development. But it's all after school, right? And like they're getting home at 930 at night sometimes, right? And we're running them out to, you know, 45 minute drives because it's a regional team. And, um, yeah. you know, I said the other day, I'm like, boy, it'd be nice if 
when when Hudson got home, like he was just home, right? Like you're not going anywhere else, and you get some family time and time with the brothers and everything else. So I, I do think that's a nice, an, a, a real nice uh, amenity there of the of the academy environment that the, yeah. the week weekdays nights are are open. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. Are you planning on having Landon? Do you, have you thought about next year for for Landon yet, or is you think he's going to be in that league again, or maybe somewhere else? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Everybody's uh, starting to ask me that, and I don't know. <laughs> yeah i have to have to play somewhere yeah i guess yeah there's lots of time yeah. to figure it out but yeah that's the age-old yeah. question right what is it going to be better for him to really dominate at his age level or is it gonna be better to you know be challenged and maybe still make an impact at uh at the u18 triple a level i guess is what you're probably having to decide right yeah yeah exactly i don't know it's a conversation we'll have to have with a lot of different people i don't want to make that decision on my own so Right. Try to reach out to a lot of different uh, hockey people that are that know him and know the levels and kind of make a big joint decision. Yeah, cool. Do you plan on being a yeah. part of the coaching uh, staff there at Edge next year again? Uh, yeah, yeah, with the U15 preps. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So regardless of where Landon goes, you'll still be there being the coach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Yeah, I like I like coaching this level. Yeah, it's a good age group, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's some. Uh, some tough days, right? Like they're at a funny age where they're uh, lots of the off ice stuff, you know, kids get in arguments and you got to be the police sometimes and the referee, but, uh, yeah. but all in all they're yeah, it's a fun, really fun age group too. Awesome. Well, I'll let you go. We've, uh, I know you were on the bus late and I, we went, uh, we went 90 minutes and then that's plenty, but we could go, go longer. I'm sure. I mean, we didn't celebrate your career quite as much as I wanted to, but um, anyways, maybe it's more relevant with where we're at now and where you're at and, and all the, yeah. all that you've we're learned old. from those, from those 18 years or whatever it was, right. Which now you're trying to pour back into, uh, into the boys that you're working with. So uh, thank you for doing yeah. what you do, by the way, I, I know coaching makes a massive difference for these players and um, those, those of you know players like you that have, have the experience and they know where, where these where these players want to get to is, is is helping them along the way so so thanks for that and thanks for sharing all your yeah. knowledge today with us no thank you thank you for sticking around to the end of episode 80 no not 82 my goodness it's 92 we are now eight away from 100 episodes that is quite uh what's that called a landmark uh pretty cool 100 episodes are nearing uh that would be goodness how much, how long are my episodes? Roughly 60 to 90 minutes, even if they're all 60 minutes, which are longer, that would be 6,000 minutes of recorded content. Uh, that's a long time to be in front of a microphone, something that I never thought I would have been doing, ever. So crazy uh, that this, is, uh, this has happened. So crazy that we have so many episodes in the book and uh, that really it feels like I'm kind of just getting started because this has been... A now a new found initiative to to go back to the roots of what it, where up my hockey started, which was as a podcast, and I'm going to um, continue to offer these, like I said, on a weekly basis, and to really double down on the podcast and to double down on the on the content and the and the discussions and and these these conversations that I think really need to happen. Um, in in uh, For me, they need to happen because they, they serve me very well. I, I'm always j jacked up after I have a call. And uh, and I know that they serve you as well, the, the, the listener and the audience, because uh, of all the messages that I'm getting and all the, and all the great reports of... Uh, of you enjoying and getting value from from the podcast it sounds like it, it leads to discussions internally within your car rides or, or at the dining room, dining room table or amongst beers with your with your friends so i uh i do appreciate that and uh and i hope that you guys are starting uh maybe to think a little bit outside the box and maybe to to challenge your own concept of what it means to be on this hockey journey and maybe what development means and and maybe what a, what an important piece mindset is or isn't to to the process so uh thanks again for being here till the end mickey if you're listening to this or anyone uh that is a mickey dupont fan thank you for tuning in if you're a first time listener uh i really like trying to reach out in different areas to different people um because it's it introduces uh the program and and the and the story to to new audiences so if you are a first time listener you're still here by all means go back and check out some of your favorite people there'll be names you recognize on my guest list and maybe some names you won't uh but i promise that there's gold in, in, in all the episodes and uh and 
and there and the conversations worth listening to. So once again, thanks again for being here. It's been a blast, uh, Mickey. Thanks for thanks for sharing your knowledge with us. Best of luck to your boys and, and to your journey along the way, and to all of you out there. Continue to play hard and keep your head up. Cheers.